Well, we've finished our sermon series on the cross, but I hope we haven't forgotten about the cross because the next sermon series and really every sermon ever preached just builds on the foundation laid by the cross. Jesus died for you. That was the message of the last two months. But now in response, what are you going to do about it? The scripture calls us to respond to Christ's gift on the cross in different ways. And today we're talking about holiness. God calls us to holiness. And there are two scriptures that I want to share with you that speak to that. First is from the Old Testament, the book of Exodus chapter 3. This is Moses. One day Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock far into the wilderness and came to Sinai, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the middle of a bush. Moses stared in amazement. Though the bush was engulfed in flames, it didn't burn up. This is amazing, Moses said to himself. Why isn't that bush burning up? I must go see it. When the Lord saw Moses coming to take a closer look, God called to him from the middle of the bush, Moses, Moses, here I am, Moses replied. Do not come any closer, the Lord warned. Take off your sandals, for you are standing on holy ground. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. When Moses heard this, he covered his face because he was afraid to look at God. And from 1 Peter chapter 1, Peter says, So prepare your minds for action and exercise self-control. Put all your hope in the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed in the world. So you must live as God's obedient children. Don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You didn't know any better then. But now you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. For the scriptures say you must be holy because I am holy. This is the word of the Lord. Well, I quoted the song over and over again, and, and I'll do it again. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Jesus died for you. But that puts a claim on your life. And you are called, called to be a disciple, and discipleship is a collection of responsibilities. Some of them are outlined in the prayer of confession about how we're to live our lives. But one of them, maybe the most important, is to be holy, to be in God's presence, to share God's holy nature. And human beings have always wanted to be holy. But what exactly does it mean? What does holy mean? Well, some synonyms are hallowed, sacred, sanctified. But if you're like me, those words, they just sound kind of like spooky words to me. I'm not really sure what they mean. So to put it in more concrete terms, holy means set apart. Set apart. The ancient Hebrew mind saw the world divided in two realms. The holy and the common, the sacred and the profane. Now profane really just means common. Profane, we use profanity, we use that to describe things that are sort of objectionable. But for Hebrew, ancient Hebrew mind, profane just meant common, ordinary versus special. So there were people who were set apart and those people were priests. Or saints. There were places that were set apart, and those places were sanctified. So holy really means extraordinary, uncommon, outside of the natural, normal way of life. Supernatural, transcendent, extraordinary. Just think of it like that, extraordinary. 
those moments, those places, those experiences that take us out of the ordinary into something beyond, set apart for the extraordinary. That's what holy means. And human beings have sought these experiences in every time, every place, and every culture. And I'm going to tell you about one of them, and it's a little outrageous. It might be a little shocking, but this is the goddess Atargatis. She was the Syrian goddess of the sun and the moon during the time when Rome ruled Syria. Atargatis had a pretty demanding nature. Men who wanted to serve as priests, and this is true from the historical evidence, men who wanted to serve as priests of Atargatis had to go to her temple and in a fit of mystical ecstasy take up a sword that was set apart for this very purpose and cut off their genitals. Then, naked, they would run through the streets holding in their hands what they had lost until they came upon a house that they felt led by her spirit and then they would toss it in. Any house so sanctified or set apart would then be obliged to provide the new priest of Atar Goddess with feminine attire. Now this was outrageous even by pagan standards. The, ancient, the other ancient pagans, whose worship was not tame, let me tell you, even they thought this was a bit of a high ante to lay upon an uncertain table. And everyone, everyone felt sorry for the housekeeper. I think I would too. Now, I don't bring this story up just to tell something offensive and shocking. But it's to illustrate the passion, the amount of self-sacrifice, the amount of effort human beings are willing to put into seeking an experience of the holy. Catholic priests lay upon the altar almost as extreme of a sacrifice giving up their own pleasure for all of life. Monks deprive themselves of sleep. They fast. They under all, undergo all sorts of uh, self-denial. Maybe not as extreme as this, but all in pursuit of the blessing, the presence, the experience of the holy. And people go on pilgrimages, vacations, and they spend exorbitant amounts of money to have extraordinary experiences. They, they spend thousands of dollars on yoga classes to have experiences that take them beyond the common and the ordinary. Now, all of this might just make you want to not be very religious and just be kind of a normal person, right? And thank God normal secular people don't engage in any kind of absurd, frenzied activity, like the next slide. Imagine an alien anthropologist attending a European soccer game. That's what that is. People with their faces painted, screaming, yelling, half naked. Someone who wasn't acculturated in our world would see this and think that's that's religious, spiritual frenzy. That's seeking an uncommon, extraordinary experience. Go to the next slide. Those are Beatles fans. I'm going to upset my mom again. I talked bad about Ohio last week. And I, but look at the faces of those women. Tell me that that's not religious ecstasy. Another, another slide. Look at her face. Tell me that secular people don't pursue the holy in their own way. You know those stories that they tell of the, uh, the person who, who wants enlightenment and they go to the Zen Buddhist temple and they wait outside the gates, sometimes for days in the cold, waiting to be admitted to see the wise monk who will share with him his wise enlightenment? We'll go to the next slide. These are Apple fans waiting outside the Apple store for days in the cold 
and the rain and the snow. Just to have that transcendent experience of the latest and the greatest technology. Secular people seek the holy too. They just don't know it. They go to great lengths searching for these experiences of the extraordinary, whether they do it through sports or through music or through technology or sadly through drugs and alcohol. Something deep inside all of us seeks the holy, the experience of that which is set apart, extraordinary, transcendent and beyond the common. And there are, there are experiences all of us have had with this. You've had holy moments. I think of some of the ones in my own life. The birth of a child is a holy moment. The moment that child takes its first breath, utters its first cry, the first time you hold the child, that is uncommon, extraordinary, and set apart. Last week, I got to hold Riley, Allie's baby, who'd just been born a few days before. Wow, that is special. I'll never get to hold her again that new. And at the other side of life, there are holy experiences too. Once I was standing at the hospital bed of a man who was in his last moments, and in one hand I held the hand of his wife, and in the other hand I held his. And we prayed, and at the end of that prayer, he took his last breath. I'll tell you, I wanted to take off my shoes. I was standing on holy ground. We have all had experiences of the holy that took us out of the common everyday life and told us that something here is special. And I think this even happens in ways that we're not aware of. There are holy places, holy moments that we probably just walk right across without stopping, without taking off our shoes. There are, whole, there are holy places that we can be unaware of. This is what happens to Jacob in this story. This is Jacob. You know, he was wandering out in the wilderness. Uh, he was sort of on the run from his brother Esau, who he cheated. And Jacob lays his head down upon a stone and he takes a nap. And he has a vision. Taking one of the stones there, he, Jacob, put it under his head and lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven. And the angels of God were descending and ascending on it. There above it stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Next slide. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in this place. And I was not aware of it. One more. He was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. So Jacob has a dream and recognizes that he had laid his head down on a stone that was holy. And when he becomes aware of this holiness, he is obligated to worship he sets up an altar and he gives thanks that this place was set apart. And I think that the church is this kind of place for us today. We come to church like Jacob, tired. And maybe some of us are even tempted to take a nap. We come to church and we sit in the pews and we think maybe more about where we're going to lunch than that this is a holy place. But then there are certain times that make us aware that this is holy ground. Maybe we, maybe we think of all the babies who've been baptized at that fount. Maybe you think of all the prayers that have been spoken right where you're sitting. Thousands, hundreds of thousands. Maybe you think of the tears that have been shed where you're sitting at funerals for those who have died. Maybe you think of the, the, the presence of all those who have worshipped in this space for decades, 
who have now gone to be with the Lord and are looking down on us right now. And maybe you think of, I hope, all the moments of faith commitment that have happened where you're sitting. Where someone sitting right in that pew decided to trust God. Or where they surrendered a burden to God in prayer. Or where they felt and heard a call like Moses and said, here I am. I will follow you. This is holy ground. And we may not be aware of it. But when we do become aware of it, we as disciples in response to what Christ has done on the cross are called to worship and experience the holy. And we try. We try to make church feel holy. We try to remind you in as many ways as we can, as often as we can, that this is holy ground. But it's, it's not always easy. It, it reminds me of a story. Uh, I had a great professor in seminary. A man who was wise and devout. Someone, one of those professors that you admire not just for what they know, but for the kind of life that they live. This was a good, holy, and wise man. And his class was on Monday mornings. And as I got to know him, sometimes I would ask him, Hey, how was worship for you on Sunday? And he, he had this response. He would say it was good praying. It was good praying. And that struck me as different from the normal response. Usually when you ask someone, well, how was worship service? They usually respond by saying something like, well, I didn't really like the pastor's sermon. Or I did like the pastor's sermon. The pastor's sermon was really good. Or they'll talk about the music. I liked the music. I didn't like the music. And so it struck me the difference that this wise and devout man would say it was good praying. And so one day when it was my turn to preach, I told the congregation, I said, you know, my professor who is wise and wonderful, when he evaluates the worship service, he doesn't evaluate it on the sermon or the music. He says it was good praying. And I used this as sort of a lesson to my congregation. And then on Monday, I told my professor, I said, hey, I quoted you on Sunday. And he said, oh, really, what did you say? He said, well, I, when you ask, when I ask you how worship was, you don't answer like most people do. You say it was good praying. And he smiled and he said to me, that's because my minister preaches lousy sermons. <laughs> but it is... It is hard, it is hard to be aware of holiness every day on a week-to-week -week basis. It's difficult to come to church even once a week and put yourself in that mindset. But this place is holy and it can be holy even when we're not aware of it. God is in this place, and sometimes we know it, and sometimes we don't. But what matters is that He is here, and that you and I are called to be holy, to stand in this place, in the presence of God, where two or more are gathered in His name. He is here. And so as Christians, we are called to be holy, called to come to this place where God is here, whether we know it or not. Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for calling us. And as I said before, sometimes your call finds us tired or with other things to do. But you died on the cross. And you demand from us our life, our soul, our all. And your first demand is for us to be in your presence, to be holy. Lord, we pray that you would make us ever more aware that you are in this place. Make us more aware of the holy moments in the rest of our lives where you are present. And if we could just wake up and open our eyes to see that you're there, those experiences would be extraordinary, uncommon, 
transcendent. Lord, make us holy as you are holy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.